Uh, good afternoon. We are here with uh, Professor Richard Smolensi. Um, we are starting this uh, interview. This interview is uh, in the list of interview that is uh, called Free Thought on the Future. Uh, Richard Smolensi is uh, uh, Dean Emeritus of MIT Sloan uh, School of Management. Professor Smolensi is the Howard John, uh, Johnson Professor of Management Emeritus Professor of Economic uh, in MIT. And uh, is the author and co-author of uh, um, 11 books uh, and more than 120 published articles. His research uh, is uh, centered on industrial organization economics, uh, his application on the two managerial and public policy issues, uh, with particular emphasis on agri-trust, regulatory energy, and environmental policies. He is, uh, according to my opinion, is one of the most important economists in the world on uh, energy, uh, resources, and also environmental economics. Uh, so in this interview, we start with our question. The topics are related to uh, climate change, uh, energy, energy transition, and so on. The first question is uh, that, uh, uh, do you think it is possible to reach the net zero emission target by 2050? It's certainly not possible to reach net zero globally by 2050. Uh, that seems clear. The question, uh, given what's happening in China and elsewhere, the more interesting question is, can Europe do it? Could the EU do it? And could the US do it? Maybe the EU could do it. Maybe. Uh, certainly, it's technically possible. But uh, at some point, the dislocations and the speed of the dislocations will, um, I think, cause political issues. In the US, of course, the EU is not as democratic as you might like, so maybe the EU can push it through. But I, I think it's difficult. In the US, it's plainly impossible because we do not have the national consensus that would be necessary to enact very strong policies. Uh, as you know, uh, we, we recently enacted the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, uh, misnamed, which involves a lot of subsidies for climate related investment. Uh, but we can't subsidize our way to net zero. Uh, we need to use sticks as well as or probably instead of carrots. And there is simply no appetite for sticks. There is very little appetite uh, for decarbonization, or for electrification outside the electric utility industry. Um, and little appetite for decarbonizing electricity generation. So I think the US can't do it as a political matter. Could we, if we suddenly woke up and had a, had a consensus? Then I think as in Europe, it would be difficult. This is, this is not, not even 30 years. You're talking about turning the entire economy upside down. I think 2050, while desirable, is too fast. 2100, of course, but even still, it would require more of a political consensus than we have in the U.S. now. I hate to be negative about this, but I, I really think it's just, particularly in the U.S., just too ambitious. It's a dream. The dream worth worth pursuing, but it's a dream. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a dream. So we hope we can reach it uh, in, in the future. And uh, uh, so... In the debate, one of the uh, debates that there is on uh, environmental economics and so on is uh, about uh, um, mitigation and adaptation strategies. So on the one hand, yeah. we think that we can, we should reduce uh, um, CO2 emissions, greenhouse gases emissions. And also the other idea is that we are not able to reach uh, uh, and to reduce uh, the increase of temperature. So we have to adapt. Okay. So, uh, in, according to your opinion, which could be the, 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 the combined effect, which would be the more important, uh, the most important, uh, mitigation or adaptation? Uh, there is a perfect balance or between the two, or should we should uh, prioritize, prioritize one of them? You know, a, a wise person said to me some years ago, the default form of adaptation is suffering. So in that sense, we will adapt. Uh, one way or another. Mitigation, particularly of CO2, uh, has benefits that continue for thousands of years. Adaptation mainly uh, relieves present suffering or for, for a, a few decades. 
I think there is absolutely no choice but to do both. And I know there's some in the environmental community who say, well, if you focus on adaptation, you take away from mitigation. And, we, and mitigation is essential for the long-term health of the planet. Of course it is. But reducing present suffering through adaptation is uh, the right thing to do. I mean, it's hard to say, to look at what Bangladesh is going through and say, well, rather than help them, we should spend the money on mitigation. The answer is we should do both. I think um, uh, there is some sort of balance. I have no idea what it might be, but um, one needs to do both and there is no reason not to pursue both. There are limitations on both. Um, uh, the limitations on mitigation, I think are largely political. The, the, uh, the uh, limitations on adaptation have to do both with uh, lack of knowledge and with the fact that the, the hardest hit countries are not where the money is. Uh, so you want to do adaptation in Bangladesh, it isn't going to come from the Bangladeshis. So I, I think that there's a political limit uh, to both, but I see no reason to disfavor one or the other. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, both, uh, and uh, so we have uh, some also in some cases also a uh, budget constraint uh, in some cases in order to adopt it. So we have to ch to choose between the two. Uh, but I understand that in some well, cases but, we do. But, but let me be clear: the budget constraint. I mean, look, mitigation isn't really a matter of spending the government's money. It's a matter of giving the private sector incentives. Uh, a really stiff carbon tax or a really tight ETS limit uh, doesn't cost the government money. Government has money it can spend on adaptation. So the budget constraint is for society as a whole. Um, and I would argue that uh, uh, at least on the numbers I've seen, the costs involved in really strong mitigation and really serious adaptation don't come to huge fractions of GDP. So society as a whole can afford to do both uh, at a much greater level than at least in the U.S. we are doing. Um, uh, if the government had to finance mitigation in some sense, as the U.S. government is now trying to do through subsidy, you can't do it. Um, but that's not what it's about. Adaptation is typically government. Um, but it's not national government, right? I mean, adaptation tends to involve local responses to local problems. The sea level is rising. There's a debate in Boston about what do we do about it? It's not a debate in Washington about what do we do about it in Boston. It's a debate in Boston about what do we do about it in Boston. Um, do we retreat from the ocean? Do we put up a seawall? Where do we put up a seawall? How high? Uh, that's adaptation and it's local. And um, the budget constraint there is for society as a whole, not for national governments or for uh, the EU. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you very much for this point. So, uh, looking at the future, because you know, the title of this series is uh, Free Thought from the Future, uh, which issues other than climate change would you prioritize for our future? For example, inequalities, uh, developing countries, uh, space economies, or other things? bioethics well uh <laughs> there's so many things right i mean i i guess um i i would say inequality broadly and by that i don't mean uh gee i don't like rich people getting rich i don't like poor people staying poor and that's a problem in this country it's a problem globally uh as as related relates to less developed nations I think the, and it's not unrelated to adaptation, right? When people talk about the impacts of climate change, we're beginning to see, and you see in Europe uh, in particular, migration. Um, why does climate change cause migration? Because poor people can't adapt uh, where they live. So let's go to a rich country where they, they don't have this problem. So I think dealing with poverty within and between countries has got to be uh, the big issue of our time. Uh, China has done this within its country. 
rather remarkably. Um, European countries have, have dealt with inequality and poverty better than we have in the U.S. In the U.S., we do have uh, great inequality of opportunity among regions. We do have great inequality in schools. Um, and one of the reaction, one of the consequences of that is, I think, the sort of populist movements uh, that we see in the U.S. I don't pretend to know the causes of, of populism in Europe, but in the U.S., I think it has to do with the fact that there's economic stagnation in a lot of in a lot of places and inequality of opportunity. I, I'm I'm not a big believer. I am a believer in progressive taxation, but I'm not a terribly outraged that some people are really rich. I'm terribly outraged that some people are poor from generation after generation. Uh, and that's that should not be acceptable when it can be fixed. Fixing, fixing, <laughs> bringing developing nations out of poverty is a harder question because they aren't us. Uh, foreign aid is not the answer, really. We've tried some of that. It's tends to get lost in corruption um, to an important extent. But, but solving that problem, particularly when you realize that poor countries are going to be generally more vulnerable to climate change and that that vulnerability is going to lead to migration, security problems, a great magnification of the kind of issue that Europe has faced across the Mediterranean, um, that just has to be a primary question. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll stop there. There are lots of other interesting things. You can worry about artificial intelligence uh, extinguishing our species, but I, I would take a shorter term view and worry about poverty and inequality of opportunity. Inequality of opportunity. If you're born in a poor country, you do not have the same uh, chances in life as some people, as some person born in a, a rich part of a rich country. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. And now I look at the recent uh, events. Uh, so recent, last year, last two years, after the start of war in Ukraine in uh, Europe, the topic of energy security became uh, important again. So energy security now is a you know, new important topic in, uh, especially in Europe, but in also as also in the world in general. And that one of the effects was also an increase of prices. Uh, so one, one of the causes was uh, an effect on energy system. Um, and uh, this uh, in inflation increases. Uh, so you also, uh, as, uh, have, um, as um, explained about, uh, as explained about uh, Inflation Re Reduction Act, uh, so one of the effects in the US, uh, was a subsidies uh, for a uh, green economy also. And uh, uh, the point is uh, um, inflation could be a problem also because we are thinking again, again, especially in Europe, in order to reduce the prices. And the one of the effects could be also a uh, reduction of uh, uh, the effort in the direction of reduction climate change. So we have to increase, to reduce prices of energy. Uh, in, 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 in Europe, we have also added some uh, uh, subsidies uh, in order to reduce prices and so the fight against climate change uh, may be in, in the second plan, in, the, in this second level in this moment. So the question is, uh, what could be the effect of fight against climate change and the net zero emission target related to this? So the new uh, topic related to energy security. Well, you, you, you raise a question that is at base political, right? I mean, you could say, uh, Energy security means we shouldn't be reliant on uh, uh, unreliable suppliers for our energy. Uh, this also has to do with um, uh, decoupling uh, from China to some extent. We are nervous in other sectors. We're nervous about being reliant on China, given that the hostility of the relationship um, um, between us. I think how you how Europe reacts, first place, um, how Europe reacts is ultimately political, ultimately political. In the very short run, the problem is inflation, but it's not, inflation is too timid. I mean, I saw what happened to electricity bills in European countries. And I also saw 
the outrage at the high profits that uh, uh, some renewable suppliers, renewable generators were, wind and solar generators were earning because gas was on the margin and gas went way up and so electricity prices went up. The short answer, of course, is an excess profits tax, and you can't do an excess profits tax, I'm told, under EU, under EU law. Um, so the first instance was politicians scrambling to find a way to deal with the shock uh, to, um, to consumers who became very angry. The longer term problem is, okay, uh, if you don't want to rely on Russia, not to put too fine a point on it, what do you do? Well, you want to get your energy elsewhere uh, and you want to use homegrown sources of energy to the extent possible. That might mean doubling down on investing in wind, solar and uh, transmission. Or it might mean starting coal plants. Both are responses to uh, unreliable supply. Both give you more security. One is good for climate. One is terrible for climate. I, I don't have an answer. I think that the net effect will probably be uh, generally to um, uh, take attention away from pursuing carbon mitigation just because, well, yes, that's nice, but we have to deal with now. Uh, so I think there'll be a short-term focus. Climate mitigation demands a long-term focus. Uh, so I think being short-termist will tend to uh, harm the um, um, uh, pursuit of zero emission, net zero emissions and, uh, and reduction of uh, uh, climate damages generally. Doesn't have to. But I think in the short term, it will. I mean, the, the political react the political... I'm sorry. One political argument could be, you saw what happened when we relied on Russian gas. We should rely on good Italian wind and sun and not be dependent on those uh, crazy Bolsheviks. Uh, that may take a little longer to put into play, but um, uh, particularly when you can get natural gas from other sources. So I, I don't know what it. I, I think it, it probably won't be a good thing. This this shock, and this focus on energy security, and more to the point, focus on insecurity of supply, it won't be good for mitigation. Doesn't have to be bad, but it probably will be. That was a very rambly answer, but because it's a it's a complicated question, and it's a it's a political question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the point is, but the point is to discuss on this. On, yeah, uh, rather political, uh, more or less, is related to. Uh, um, so speaking about decoupling, and also the link with, between environmental decoupling. So if uh, I think they are combined in some sense, uh, and so link to this, I think also there is a think about uh, what could be the conference of parties. So at the end of the conference of parties, at the end. In many cases, we have uh, some uh, success, in other cases, uh, you know, same failures, so problem related to coordination failure is a typical example. And uh, which could be the manner, I think, according to your opinion, to improve this uh, coordination. So on the one hand, uh, on the conference on parties, it is possible to obtain some better results. Uh, and on the other hand, uh, so thinking also about uh, the, the link between uh, decoupling uh, U.S.-China and also uh, environmental decoupling. Well, let me say a little bit about those. Those are two complicated questions. The conference of parties. I, I, I haven't been to a, a COP in a long time, but but the the mechanism is about as unwieldy as you could imagine. Right, we're going to have. A large number of countries and everybody can speak and we're going to go for consensus and uh, uh, everything's voluntary. And is that conceivably going to get it done? I don't think so. I mean, it is what we have now is what we used to call pledge and review. 
with review being not quite as strict as one might like. The mechanism is now every so often countries make promises and then uh, we try to see that they live up to their promises and maybe that'll do the trick. I don't think, I think that's where you have to start. I think it's good that we've started. It's good that there are um, uh, national promises, so to speak. But, you know, the basic economic structure says uh, that's not going to be enough. Uh, that relies on countries being willing to make sacrifices for the global good. And, you know, Europe will do that. And I admire that. The U.S. these days is less likely to do that. And if you look at India and China, uh, and Indonesia for that matter, they need to do something because their diplomats have to go to conferences. But are they going to make great sacrifices for Europeans and Americans? That seems implausible. Um, we're going to have to get um, new mechanisms in place. What will they look like? Well, trading systems. Um, I'm a big believer that emissions trading has to happen, that it's potentially a vehicle um, that we've talked about for years, decades, that if we have tight restrictions in the U.S. and Europe, and those restrictions can be met by companies subsidizing emissions reductions in poor countries, and if we could get that system right, then uh, tight controls in the rich countries may drive uh, uh, global, global reductions. I think that's tricky to get right. There are enforcement issues, there are additionality issues, there are all kinds of issues that have been discussed in the, in the, in the COP, various COPs. Um, and maybe that's the answer. Maybe climate clubs that Bill Nordhaus and others have pushed are the answer. One can think of the EU as a climate club, um, particularly when you add carbon border adjustments. You begin to think about giving countries incentives to join the club. I think we just, we're not going to get there with just what's going on. Um, uh, but you know, it's easy as an economist to say, well, obviously this should happen. We should have global controls and we should have a global emissions trading system and it should all be swell and a common carbon tax and all that. Um, but it doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what we think. What matters is what is politically feasible. And at the moment, Paris and the Paris regime seem to be what's politically feasible. I think it's it's important that a number of people have fought the good fight to make sure that um, the relevant documents uh, are at least permissive on the emissions trading front. And perhaps something can grow out of that. I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in putting in place foundations, even if you're not ready to build on them today. So maybe we can build on those foundations. But I, I think it, it has to has to happen. I think you asked about the car, carbon border adjustment. Um, and, and let me say a word about that, because it's funny. In the US, we don't have a carbon price. We don't have the anything like the ETS. But there are a lot of people who want to put in place some sort of carbon border adjustment. And you know, I've I've listened to I've listened to descriptions of legislative proposals, and it's like, really? Adjusting for what? You know, it's like, well, we're cleaner than some other countries. And so countries that make stuff in ways that are dirtier than the way we make stuff should pay a tariff. I go, okay, how exactly do you compare how clean we make an automobile with how clean the Germans make automobiles? Parts come from lots of different places. They're assembled in different places. How, for any kind of complicated commodity, can you do that? Well, what about cement? Our cement is cleaner than Mexican cement, and so we'll put a tariff on Mexican cement? 
how can you do that? Uh, and on what basis? And if we don't have a tax on our cement, how can we, with a straight face, put a tax on Mexican cement? So I, I think carbon border adjustment mechanisms done right uh, have an important role to play because they done right, they encourage countries to join. Uh, I have friends who know more about the European mechanism than I do that say it's pretty protectionist. Uh, the proposals for the US are very protectionist. Uh, there is political backing because <laughs> the unspoken part is this will hurt my competitors. What a good idea. So I think carbon border adjustment mechanisms have a role to play uh, because if I'm going to pay, if I'm exporting to you and I'm going to pay a tax, a, a carbon tax on my exports to you, and if my exports are, to you are important, then what the hell, I may as well have a tax on everything. That That's kind of the, that's kind of the most, the notion. Um, and also you do want to protect your vulnerable industries from um, uh, competition from people who don't take climate seriously. So it does have an important role to play if done right. If done in the US without a national carbon policy, it's just pure protection. It's just pure protection and plays no constructive role. Um, I, I realize the Europeans, Europeans are properly upset at the competitive effects of this massive subsidy program the US is engaged in. Put on top of that, a protectionist carbon border adjustment and I could see people being very angry with just with justification. So, uh, and you asked about decoupling. <laughs> you you asked about twenty seven questions. So look, I think uh, at the moment, uh, decoupling takes many forms, um, at least in the U.S. And I expect also in the EU, part of it is given China's behavior in the trade world um, and our secretary of the treasury is over there now lecturing them about their unfair trade practices, which is a nice thing you do to your host. Um, given uh, China's uh, propensity to steal intellectual property, China's propensity to subsidize quietly, uh, competitors uh, and a variety of other things. It's dawned on people, we don't wanna to become too reliant on China, uh, given the tension between our two systems. Um, where that goes it, it, it is kind of a deep question. I mean, turns out we, we buy uranium from Russia these days. Uh, you probably do too. Why are we buying uranium from Russia? Because we have no other source. Um, so are we gonna buy things from China? Yes. Are we gonna buy uh, solar panels and you're gonna buy solar panels from China? Yes. Um, are we gonna try to develop domestic solar manufacturing, solar panel manufacturing again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we're not gonna stop buying from China. I think decoupling means develop alternative sources. It doesn't mean cut them off. It means develop alternative sources. It's not clear to me that this links to the energy transition or to the uh, uh, climate mitigation. It has more to do with um, national security issues, uh, with, with uh, a, rare metals um, with a variety of things like that. Um, you know, if we rely on China for metals we need to produce electric vehicles and we say that's a bad idea. Well, that doesn't mean we don't produce electric vehicles. It means we find other sources, I think, I think. The only way it could be a bad thing is, um, gee, Chinese solar panels are cheaper but we don't want to use Chinese solar panels. We'll stop using solar panels. That would be a bad thing. I I don't 
see much of that happening. At least in the US, the alternative is we want to subsidize things domestically. And that decouples, but not, I think, in a in a negative way as far as the environment's concerned. So I don't think the kind of decoupling, at least that I see, uh, is likely to have a negative effect on, on uh, climate change mitigation. Unless I misunderstood the question. <laughs> No, no, it's okay. No, no, it's okay. I, I'm thinking about uh, so trying to be linked to to this point, you know, because I think it's according to my opinion is very important. So you uh, spoken about uh, um, rare materials, uh, uh, critical rare materials is one of the point in which uh, so looking at the diversification. So I have uh, two two points about this. The first one is uh, uh, I think also linked to the the coupling the idea of uh, reshoring. You no, know, after uh, COVID nineteen. And also after energy crisis, right. we start in a, uh, we started to reshoring. And also the, the new word for me is also trend shoring. So the idea of right. uh, of right. uh, that is uh, in this sense is uh, uh, in all the cases where you are reshoring or fresh shoring, uh, what you are doing in terms of uh, the prices is also according to my opinion is uh, to diversify the risk. Uh, so where before before covid-19 in all the cases we move in the direction of the, uh, the lower cost the lowest cost in general so we are taking some input from from china and so on because the cost was very low in this case after covid-19 especially after covid we started to think about that the, the, the price maybe could, could take into account should take into account also something related to the risk so i have to change my portfolio of inputs. But in this sense, uh, the point is that I'm also taking some prices that could be higher. No? So the final, the final point is uh, that uh, the, the high increase in the cost that could be also an increase of uh, inflation in general. And this, according to my opinion, could be, again, uh, uh, if you internalize, endogenize the, uh, the risk in the price. Is that, no, is a, is a, we are taking into account a new price, we're taking those into account this in order to be uh, more safe in the future, no? to avoid the risk. And this is a change globally, no? this is a change in the, the global world. But the point is uh, some things, some uh, outputs can be also with uh, higher prices. And so maybe could be, could be reduce uh, the speed of uh, some types of technologies. In some cases, we, we could also have uh, some bottlenecks uh, in the in the in the um, input in the output production, also green production. Linked to this, uh, there is the control of uh, uh, critical and rare materials. What we are looking today is that, uh, according to what I know so far, is that the majority, so the higher percentage of uh, the uh, control of uh, these kind of materials is in the hands of China, no, uh, internally and also. Uh, controlling also other uh, mines uh, around the world. One of the, the point is, uh, is true, <laughs> the first question, so could be a danger because I understand also that rail are not so rare materials in general, uh, or uh, is uh, depends uh, strongly on the cost in order to produce this because also there is a environmental cost in order to extract. And uh, the second point, which could be the point of the U.S. in this situation, because uh, uh, at the moment, what I'm looking at uh, is that the U.S. probably, now they are waiting what is the situation in the market uh, and uh, looking at uh, increases, uh, a reduction, the possibility to use uh, these red materials from uh, production of China, as you said before, uh, maybe they started, also Europe uh, is starting uh, also to use uh, some internal mines. So, for example, we have lithium, uh, in uh, also in Sardinia and other places in the world. So I understand this complex <laughs> question, but it's, a, it's also a complex world. And so I don't know if it's clear the question that is uh, the summarizing, uh, this could be the role of rail materials and the control of this kind of uh, uh, materials uh, for energy transition. Well, there are a couple of things going on. As you point out, in, in a world in which, um, let's say China behaves well, uh, then uh, raising cost in order to reduce dependence on China is economically inefficient, and it will raise the costs of all kinds of things. 
However, in a world in which there's some probability that China doesn't behave well, like cuts off uh, critical materials, then, you know, it, it, this is not a, a, a safe strategy. And that's the argument people make is it's, we're, it's worth to pay a price to get insurance against China's bad behavior. That's what's going on. And how much insurance do we need and how much should we pay for it is something you can debate endlessly. Um, but um, uh, so it is going to happen. And I think you're going to get the decisions to French or uh, and uh, onshore made at several levels. Companies who have who were burned by supply chain shocks um, and and of various kinds have all in many cases rethought their strategy and thought in terms that I just described, which is, well, yeah, it may cost us more to do it at home or to do it nearby or to do it in a country that's stable, but that's insurance. That's insurance. I don't, you get short-term inflation from that as costs go up and prices go up. I don't think you get a process of inflation out of that. Remember, inflation isn't just a, an increase in prices. It's a it's a process of prices continuing to increase. So if I raise my costs and I raise my prices, I'm done. I'm not going to keep doing it. I can't bring it. I'm not going to bring it closer. The other level at which you get insurance purchased is at the national level. So we say, yeah, this Chinese equipment, telecommunications equipment is cheaper and better but we're worried about it, so we won't use it. Okay, that costs. Um, and we're worried about Chinese control of lithium, which isn't that rare, but some of the metals are pretty rare. Uh, so we're gonna subsidize production here or nearby. Again, That's a that's a that's a problem in the sense that oh let's say the cost of electric vehicles has increased because some of the metals are now more expensive because we're not buying from China. But the fear is that someday if we don't do these things, China will raise prices dramatically. I mean, you know, a monopolist has a tendency to do stuff like that. So if we don't diversify supply, even if it costs us something, we're providing some insurance against China acting like a monopolist. I, given Chinese behavior, some of that insurance, it seems to me, is worth buying. It, it raises costs. And yeah, we can talk about how inflation gets triggered by a one-time increase in prices. But I think most theories say there is a distinction between a, an increase in prices and an increase a, and a steady increase in prices, which is what you need for inflation. So I, I'm not terribly worried about the inflationary impacts of of decoupling. I am worried about taking it too far. I mean, if the world becomes two trading blocks, a Chinese block and a US EU block, that would be unfortunate. Um, that you know, I, just plain old comparative advantage would get lost, and um, I, I, I don't see, depending on who's in which block, of course, um, I, I don't see how the world doesn't lose substantially from that kind of bifurcation. But I don't think that's in the cards, at least not, not that I can see. Um, I don't think it's in China's interest. It's not in our interest. It's not in the EU's interest to completely decouple. So I don't think we will. What partial decoupling looks like beyond buying insurance in some sectors, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I was reading the other day that the big maker of electric vehicles is a Chinese company. That I don't remember the name now, but they lead the world in sales of electric vehicles. They do not sell in the United States. They do not sell in the United States, I expect, because they're worried about what the U.S. government might do. 
Um, we want to, we want to, we want electric vehicle vehicles produced domestically. We have a subsidy scheme that requires uh, certain kinds of domestic production. So even a Chinese capitalist might say, do I want to sell over there? Given that they kind of fixated on doing their own vehicles. If I get too much market share, they'll find a way to squeeze me out. Why should I invest? So that's a bad thing. If Chinese electric vehicles are better than ours, I'd like to buy them, unless there is some reason to be afraid of what China might do uh, in the electric vehicle space. I'm unaware of any stories that say China might suddenly withhold all of its vehicles or use them to weaponize them. But it's worth thinking about. But I can understand why China doesn't sell those vehicles in the U.S., because they they have reason to fear what we might do. The Biden administration is has a very protectionist approach to the world, and boy, if China starts taking share from domestic vehicle manufacturers, they, they will they will want to do something. So safer for China not to not to um, tempt it. Okay, okay. I have, uh, I have two questions about uh, um, resources. The first is uh, uh, thinking about, uh, so one of the points related to energy transition maybe is also to diversify also resources, no? In reduction of fossil fuels, using other type of resources. One of the problems that I have in general is uh, um, the, the capacity level that we could uh, obtain by using other resources. So the only manner, I think, in order to substitute the fossils also to diversify, to have a, a portfolio, also in this case, of combined resources. One of these is nuclear power, uh, fission and fu fusion. So we have uh, all, all know that are different, but I would like to know your opinion about uh, uh, nuclear power. Uh, well, um, there are many questions here. I think... I look at the German reaction to Fukushima and just scratch my head and say, you, you, you want to lead in emissions reduction. None of your nuclear reactors are on the ocean. So you take the Fukushima accident as a reason to close them down uh, and, and keep your coal plants running. So nuclear power everywhere has such a such a um, such political baggage. Um, uh, that that the notion that we're going to go forward and build a lot more of the kinds of large scale fission reactors that we have had, I think isn't likely. I just, for reasons that have to do a little bit with economics, but a lot with politics, uh, people do not like nuclear power of the kind that we have seen. Is that rational? I think it's not rational. But I don't think it matters whether it's rational or not. It's strong. So um, but that doesn't mean nuclear power is dead. Um, we are, there's a move in this country and probably in Europe to design and in the reasonably near term build uh, small scale nu nuclear reactors that have the advantage, have advantages of design that they are inherently safe, they fail safe, they don't need the kind of elaborate safety uh, systems that the conventional reactors do, and also that they can be uh, mass produced. You know, as somebody said, we've never made an of anything, any reactor, the French kind of have, but most of the rest of us, every reactor is a custom job. Well, the whole point is these small reactors, the, the notion is, can be mass produced. Now, if they can be mass produced and you can demonstrate safety, can you in fact overcome the political aversion to nuclear power? So I was having this conversation maybe a couple of years ago, actually pre-COVID, but a conversation pre-COVID about this in a taxi in Washington. And I'm explaining, you know, they're small, they're safe, they can be distributed around the country. And the taxi driver says, are you telling me that you're going to put nuclear reactors on trucks and drive them all around the country? I don't know. So that may not work. <laughs> that may not work. 
but but there's potential. I, I think the potential for conventional fission at large scale, not, not great. The other interesting avenue is fusion. Now, fusion is, is something that has always been 30 years away uh, for many years now. The, the big change is advances in magnets. Uh, magnet technology, a lot of very smart people say, oh, we can do things now that we couldn't do before. And we can do them at, at, at non-crazy scale. We can do them at modest scale. Um, there are several companies founded by smart people from MIT into which MIT has put money that actually believe you can do a fusion reactor in the near term. I, I don't take much, uh, I don't get much optimism from the um, break-even experiment at Berkeley. That's you know, shooting lasers at pellets. Doesn't strike me as the way forward, but confining a plasma in a torus uh, with these new magnets uh, a la the old tokamak design is strikes people as promising. What are the economics? Is it possible? You know, I, I will not live to see this, even if I take very good care of myself, uh, because it's still going to take a while to do if, if it can be done. But I think small reactors and fusion at least seem to have some potential. I think conventional light water reactors, not really. Not really. Uh, uh, in a way, it's too bad. Uh, nuclear advocates keep saying, look, here is a carbon-free source of, e of electricity that is dispatchable, for heaven's sake, um, and is not intermittent and doesn't shut down at night or doesn't shut down when the wind doesn't blow. And the safety record is actually quite good. That doesn't account for the politics. And I will say, if the Russians do something in Ukraine to that reactor, then all bets are off. That's going to be worse than Fukushima if it happens, right? They've already blown up a large dam and flooded a large fraction of the country. If they destroy that reactor or produce a nuclear accident, they're in control of the reactor, after all. Um, that will if not end the future of nuclear power, come awfully close, aside from the humanitarian disaster that it will produce. So very questionable. So, <laughs> so uh, looking also again about uh, resources, what about uh, hydrogen for? Yeah, let me see a few words about hydrogen. It's, it's um, a very interesting. We've done some, some work on it at MIT. And when I say we, I mean other people. Uh, but um, there is the notion that we can use hydrogen as an, uh, a vehicle to store electricity. Uh, we produce it with sunlight, put it in a cave, and then use it again to generate electricity. And the answer is you can do that. But at least in the work done here, it's not terribly promising. Uh, it's just too inefficient, the round trip. And you can't do much to make it more efficient. But but there are two good things about, about hydrogen. First, it can substitute for natural gas as a, in, in industry as a source of process heat. That's a good thing. And the second thing is generating hydrogen by, from electricity uh, at scale gives, with storage gives you a large dispatchable load. And having a load, you, right? If you can store hydrogen and you have enough storage facility, even if the demand from industry for hydrogen is constant, you don't have to generate it constantly. You can stop. You can stop producing hydrogen when the power system is under stress, and you can ramp up the production of hydrogen when there's plenty of excess capacity in the power system. And in systems driven by wind and solar, you get both events with some frequency. So in the work done at MIT, producing hydrogen at scale is a benefit to the electric power system because you can dispatch the load. Um, now, there is, there is hope in some circles that, well, we'll use hydrogen 
in the existing natural gas system to substitute for natural gas in home heating. And everybody I know who thinks hard about this says that makes no sense. Um, it's a small molecule and it leaks. And if you have an old system as we have, and I expect many European systems are old, natural gas leaks now, hydrogen would leak a lot. And hydrogen leaks, you know, can lead to explosions pretty easily. So, and, and hydrogen makes things brittle. So putting hydrogen through today's pipes is probably not a workable solution. You know, people in the natural gas business hate to hear this, that, you know, folks, you will need to shut down because we will electrify home heating and cooling, which <laughs> brings me back to 2050, by the way. Uh, I, I, I didn't give you an example that I should have when we talked about, can we make net zero by 2050? My example is simple. I'm in a building. It's a condominium building. It's got 10 units. It was built in the 1920s. Our heating system is hot water. We pump hot water. We heat it and pump it around, and it's through radiators. Uh, you say, well, what you should do is use heat pumps. I say, wait a minute. How exactly do we do that? Well, you just have to install ductwork so that you're blowing hot air around the building instead of pumping water through pipes. Okay, and exactly we're in Boston, so the temperature is sometimes not too conducive. Where do we get the heat? Where do we put the stuff on the roof? Do we have enough roof area for 10 units? I mean, in, in new single family dwellings using electricity to heat and cool, obviously. In old multifamily dwellings, this is not simple. This is gonna be very expensive and Getting it done by 2050 uh, uh, will be very hard, very hard. We went through a couple of years ago uh, an expansion of uh, an increase in the electricity service to our building uh, for a variety of reasons. People wanted to do more air conditioning and special climate control and all that. It was a six months process. It involved working with the local utility. It involved digging into the street. It involved installation of cables. And I now say, okay, uh, we have one person with an electric vehicle. Pretty soon we're all gonna want them. If we're gonna do that and put heat pumps in this old building, boy, it may be possible, but boy, will it be expensive. And I can see people living in the building at that point saying, I don't care, there has to be another way. There has to be another way. Uh, so once you get down to the nitty gritty, I mean, I was talking about political issues and is there the commitment, but what you get down into exactly what net zero requires, uh, particularly old structures, old electric power systems, it's not all transmission and generation, it's distribution. Yeah, we're going to have charging stations everywhere. Okay, you're going to rebuild the distribution system. Okay, is your distribution system underground? Ours is in Boston. Uh, we're going to rebuild an underground distribution system and expand it dramatically. And that won't be easy. We 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 can get we can get way down pretty cheaply, but getting that last little bit out, uh, making my building electric, uh, woo. Okay, so I don't think hydrogen is a miracle. And I forgot to tell you all the hardships of getting that last little bit of carbon out. Um, but uh, if you have any two minute questions, I'm good to go. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So I have a last, uh, okay, thank you very, very much. I have a, a other, other last point. So I'm a little bit worried about uh, uh, water water management for the future. It's a very last yep. point because uh, I'm thinking about my, the future of my my children, so my daughters. So and uh, I think about uh, which will be the quantity of uh, water available for the future. Uh, because in, if I if I think about the future, I think that uh, the the glacier is melting. The, we have a lot of uh, rain. Uh, uh, is changing uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, average and also volatility. So we have a floods. Uh, the last was in Italy, for Italy was uh, two months ago. 
Um, so I think also for uh, a lot of uh, extraction, so for a lot of uh, production of energy, we need uh, water for extract oil. For in some cases, we use water for extract right, right. oil for for yeah. fracking, and we are not able to reuse uh, after having uh, uh, cleaned the water. In other cases, there are some uh, so the, the temperature is increasing and so on. So with our, all the combined effect of climate change and the world that is going in with with kind of development. And uh, my fear is also that um, probably in the future we will have uh, uh, less water and also an increased probability to have a war for water. Uh, but I don't know which could be your idea. Maybe I don't know which could be also some solution in this direction, but I'm worried about it. Well, I mean, uh, there's good reason to worry. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the first order effect, um, if, if um, uh, the world warms, then you're going to have more water vapor in the air from just evaporation from the ocean, and it's going to come down. So net net, there will be more more rain someplace, sometime. And I think the problem that we are all facing is it's not always at the right time and the right place, right? California is having an epic drought. Uh, my my brother in Illinois said uh, that the drought there is so bad that he doesn't have to mow his lawn, but he can't play golf because he can't get a tee in the ground. They break because the ground is so hard. Whereas I'm in Vermont and it's we've had almost rain almost every day for three weeks when I'm here for my summer vacation. So I, the problem we're going to have is uh first of all there will be more intense storms or more storms i think people have have argued but it'll be the wrong time in the wrong place and there's not much you can do about that i mean we rely on california for a lot of agriculture but if they don't have water they don't have water and you can't grow without water i i i think the solution as for many things, starts with recognizing the problem, but it's hard, right? Because in so many areas, as in so many areas, the past is not a good guide for the future. You can't say, oh, that was a hundred year flood and it happened again next year. <laughs> so um, it, it, is a, it is difficult for climate modelers or anybody else to say, where should we, where should we place our bets? I mean, is it going to get warm, wetter here or drier here? Are we, is it going to come down as snow? Is it going to come down as water, um, as rain rather? I, I think one of the best stories I've heard, and it has to do with adaptation, of course. This is all about adaptation. Um, a colleague said he was, he was asked in Ethiopia, uh, what should we do about climate change? And he went to the climate models and half of them said it's going to be drier. And half of them said there's going to be more rain. <laughs> and his, his recommendation to them was pave your roads from the agricultural areas to the market. If it rains a lot more, then those roads will still be usable and farmers will be able to get the produce to the markets. If it's drier, okay, that's too bad. You still have better roads. <laughs> so there is a payoff in both cases. It's just much greater in one than in the other. And I think we are all going to have to think through um, strategies like that. I mean, if I were the governor of California, Faced with this long drought, I would face a difficult choice. Will it continue? If it continues, then I need to think about one set of policy options. If it may reverse, then I need to think about another. And I will ask scientists to tell me which is more likely, and they may or may not have an answer. So I think it is a worry. Um, it's more a worry in some places than in others, uh, for sure. Um, <laughs> I, I like to ski, 
But snow is getting scarce in New England. And uh, that has implications also for what happens in the springtime if you don't get snow in the winter. Um, but, you know, maybe it'll come down as rain, uh, which is which which it always does when I want to ski. But um, you're right to worry about water. I agree with your worry. I just I just don't see. You know, it's like any kind of any other kind of adaptation. It's it's to an extent local national policies that have to be done we have to be uh, uh, engaged in we do a lot of irrigation in the u.s and people point out that yeah there's underground water but there's only so much underground water and if it doesn't rain a lot you run out of underground water and we have a big aquifer in the center of the country that people keep saying you know, it's it's running low, really. You're using a lot of it, and it's running low, and we have a tragedy of the commons problem. Any individual farmer uh, has, has uh, no effect. In aggregate, they have a profound effect. And what do you do? Um, and how do you manage that? And we have another problem that we're, we're running into, and it's causing enormous problems. Um, the Colorado River in the U.S., which runs through western states and into Mexico. We have a treaty with Mexico that obliges us to uh, provide, let that river provide them so much water. We also have agreements among the various states through which the river flows that they get so much water. The last several years, there's not been enough water to honor those commitments. What do you do now? Well, we're we're in various kinds of negotiation to figure out what you do now. Um, you can't pretend there's always going to be enough water because there hasn't been enough water. And we have not honored our commitments to Mexico or to various other parties. Um, and so um, I, I think water is going to continue to be an issue, but it's not that there'll be too little of it everywhere. Some places there will be too much of it, as you've found in Italy occasionally, and as we've found occasionally. So um, as, as a number of people have said, you might want to describe global climate change, not as global warming, but as global weirding, as everything just gets weird. More extremes, blah, blah, blah. And our children will not thank us, and our grandchildren will not thank us for letting this happen. But here we are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Richard, for your time. I learned a lot. So thank you for your time. And so, again, uh, we keep in touch. <laughs> thank you again for Very good. My pleasure. My pleasure. Good talking with you. <laughs> thank you. Bye bye.